Is that recording? Okay, it is recording. Alrighty, guys, let's go over the FRQ and then we're gonna get started with unit four, okay? So you guys should all have your exams because I already know what you guys got for your FRQ answers and it wasn't pretty for everybody. So let's go over it just so you guys have the answers and then um, we'll jump into unit four. Okay, so let's look at number six. Okay, so if you guys take a look at it, the reactants for this equation should be pretty easy to find, right? It's just water and UF6. Okay, so we know for this chemical equation, you're gonna start off with H2O or water and UF6. That's the information that we have right now. Okay, and then it tells you that the only things that are made are a solid that contains uranium, oxygen, and fluorine. So I'm just gonna, for now, write solid. Okay, and we know that it's made out of uranium, oxygen, and fluorine. But we don't know how many uh, moles of uranium, how many moles of oxygen, and how many moles of fluorine. So we don't know the numbers that go down here. So what I'm gonna do is just so that we have something to uh, refer back to and we can update as we go along, I'm just gonna write UX, that's to represent the number we should put for U. Um, it's also made of oxygen, so I'm gonna put Y, okay? Just And this is gonna be changed with the number of moles of oxygen. And then we have F and I'm gonna put Z. Okay, you guys can put whatever you want, um, but I'm just gonna use these kind of as placeholders so that we know uh, that we don't have the chemical formula for this solid, okay? And then lastly, it tells us we make some type of gas. All right, so far so good on that. Some of you guys did get part A correct, so um, hopefully you guys got that. Okay, now for part A, it tells us to determine the empirical formula of the gas. So right now, what we're gonna try to figure out is what in the world is this gas, okay? Now the information that we have about the gas is that it's 95% fluorine. So that means 95% of the weight of uh, this gas is going to be fluorine, and then the remainder is hydrogen, right? So if 95% is fluorine, what percentage is hydrogen? Yeah, 5%, right? Because we got to get to 100%. Okay, so that's all the information that I pulled out from the problem. Now, I do want to recommend to you guys, as we uh, do more problems, and as we prep for the AP test, that you always pull out all the information from the problem like this. You don't have to organize it exactly the way I do, but just having it somewhere so you have you don't have to read through the question constantly is a good way to have your information in one place. Um, that way you don't make any mistakes going back and forth. Okay. So we're basically done with all the, you know, all the text up here. Now we just need to solve the problem. So from this data, we want to find the empirical formula of the gas. Okay, so let's start with that. We're going to start with empirical formula. So I'm just going to make a little bit more room just so that we have more room to work with. So we're looking for the empirical formula of the gas here. All righty. So when we, uh, what is it, find an empirical formula, we always have to assume a 100% sample. I don't know if you guys remember that. We're going to always assume a 100 gram sample. That is what's gonna allow us to find the empirical formula. We went over this in class. Um, it should be in your notes and it's definitely in your textbook. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume a 100 gram sample of this gas. Now, if 95% of, uh, of the gas is fluorine, how many grams of fluorine is that if we're assuming 100 grams? Yeah, 95, right? And that's why we use a 100 gram sample because it's a 100% easy number to work with. So we're gonna assume that 95 grams of this sample is fluorine. And then obviously the other 5% is gonna be hydrogen. So five grams of hydrogen. Okay, and then to find the empirical formula, we just need to turn this into moles, right? So I'll give you guys maybe one minute I want you guys to uh, do one of these, pick you know, your lab partner or somebody next to you, and I want you guys to both calculate um, how many moles of fluorine and how many grams of hydrogen that is. Okay, so I'll give you guys about a minute to do that. We'll go over it real quick, and then we will, that should be the end of part one, actually.
All right, I'll give you guys maybe uh, 20 more seconds. Should be a pretty simple conversion. Alrighty guys, let's go over it real quick. So hopefully this was the setup that you guys used. We use the molar mass of fluorine, which is 19, molar mass of hydrogen, which is one. And so we should have gotten five moles of fluorine, right? Because we do 95 divided by 19, that should give you five. Five times one divided by one is gonna give you five moles of hydrogen. All right. So that means that in this 100 gram sample of this gas, uh, we have five moles of fluorine and five moles of hydrogen. So if we wanted to write the empirical formula, all we need to do is put H5, because there's five, and then F5. Okay, but we know that empirical formulas, you have to have the lowest common factor. And so we would have to just divide by the common factor, which is five. And so the empirical formula of this gas is just going to be HF. All right, so that's part one. Some of you guys were able to get that. Some of you guys got to H5F5, um, but you didn't divide by five, so you lost a point for that. Uh, just know that empirical formula is always the lowest, okay? All right, now before we move on, any questions? Okay, hopefully that part wasn't too bad. So while you guys are copying that down, I'm actually gonna be updating the information that we have right here. I'm gonna get rid of this stuff. And I'm going to write that our gas was HF. All right, guys, so if you guys are good with that, you have a copy down, uh, take a look at part B now. I'm gonna pull that up right here too. Um, so if we look at part B, now what we're looking for is what fraction of the fluorine in the original compound is in the solid and what fraction is in the gas after the reaction. Okay, so this might be a kind of a weird question, um, but if we just uh, look at our equation, it'll help us understand it. It's basically, to asking us, hey, if you look at the equation, right, the fluorine in the beginning was only in UF6, right? But we know that after the reaction happens, some of the fluorine ended up in the solid, right? And some of it ended up in the gas, HF, right? You guys see that? It got split up somehow, okay? And so it's basically just asking us what percentage of the fluorine originally in the solid UF6 ended up here, and what percentage ended up in HF? Okay, so we do need to use some stoichiometry to figure this out. So I'm going to um, erase this part right here, just so we have some more room to work with. But that's essentially uh, what the question is asking us to find. It's asking us to find, hey, how, what percentage of the original fluorine in UF6 ended up in the solid, and what percentage ended up in the gas. Okay. Now, in order to do this, we need to actually take a look at the uh, problem that we had earlier. How much UF6 did we start with to begin with? Yeah, 4.26 uh, and 7 grams of UF6. Okay. Okay. So, 4.267 grams of UF6. That's our starting number here, okay? So this is how much UF6 we start with, and then we cannot exceed this much fluorine that's inside um, this many grams of UF6. So if I go back to my uh, little screen right here, okay? We have our starting number for our stoichiometry, okay? Our starting number is going to be 4.267 grams of UF6. 
six. Okay. Now we need to figure out what we want to end up with. Okay, now we're not going to be able to do this problem all in one stoichiometry problem, but we do need to identify what we're trying to figure out. Now, if we're trying to figure out what percentage of the fluorine ended up in the solid and what percentage ended up in the gas, do we care about the uranium right now? No, right? We don't care how much uranium is in there. We only care about how much fluorine is inside of UF6. And so what we're going to be looking for is we're going to be looking for the grams of fluorine in UF6. Okay, so let me repeat that. We don't care about uranium because the question is only asking, where did the fluorine go? How much went to the solid? How much went to the gas? So it doesn't matter how much uranium is inside of UF6. We only care about the fluorine in there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use some stoichiometry to figure out how many grams of fluorine there are inside of 4.267 grams of UF6, okay? So take about maybe a minute and a half. I want you to work with the person next to you. See if you can solve out this stoichiometry problem, okay? It's the same thing that we've been doing before. Our starting number is 4.267 grams of UF6. I want you guys to use gamumaga to find out how much how many grams of fluorine are inside of UF6. So I'll give you guys about a minute and a half. Try solving that out with the person next to you. And then after that, we'll go over it and then we'll move on. Oh, then let me help you guys out a little bit. Uh, the molar mass of UF6 is 352. Okay, just to speed up the process a little. Okay, UF6 is 352 grams per mole. Yeah, this was a this was a tough problem. Did you get part A? Yeah. Oh, you got B too? Oh. Yeah, but that's the way it got kind of lucky. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough problem. All right, I'll give you guys 30 more seconds to try it out. Okay, I know this, there is going to be a recording of this, but I do recommend that you do try it out with me because if you're here anyway, might as well use this time now so you have more free time later to go watch Netflix and play video games and sleep. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll add a couple more for AP Chem. So make your work a little, a little harder. All right, so if you guys are finishing up, feel free to finish up, but let's uh, take a look at the stoic problem. So I set the first fraction up for you, right? Um, since we have grams of UF6, uh, we want to get rid of that. So we have to put grams on the bottom. And so we'll use the molar mass um, in order to uh, get rid of the grams of UF6. Now, the next one is a little bit trickier. Um, we have one mole of UF6. But again, we're not looking for UF6, we're looking for fluorine. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a ratio that tells me one mole of UF6 contains six moles of fluorine. Because if you take a look at the formula, right, it's UF6. If I have one mole of UF6, I'm going to have six moles of fluorine inside of the UF6. OK? 
Okay, just like how if I have one car, I have four wheels inside that car. Same thing here. I have one mole of UF6. I have one mole or six moles of F inside of that one mole. And so that's how we'll cancel that out. After that, pretty simple. We have one mole of F. And if we just want to find the mass of that, we know that it's 19 grams. And so this should be your stoic problem. And we know we set everything up correctly because everything cancels out to get us grams of fluorine. Okay, so if we just punch that into our calculators, make a little more room, we put in 4.267, we'll divide by 352. We're gonna multiply that by six, multiply by 19. That should give you 1.38, I'm gonna round that up to two. Okay, so that leaves us with 1.382 grams of fluorine inside of UF6. Okay, so just going back, uh, just so we can put everything together, we said earlier that UF6 we had 4.267 grams of it total. I have 1.382 grams of fluorine in there. Okay, and then later on, we'll have to figure out how much uranium is in there, but that should be pretty easy, right? You just need to subtract the fluorine and that'll give you the mass of uranium inside of UF6, but we'll do that a little bit later. Okay, so now we have the 1.382 grams of fluorine in UF6. Okay, so we know how much total uh, fluorine is inside of this reaction, right? H2O does not give you any fluorine. So the only fluorine inside this whole reaction is going to be this 1.382 grams. That means this 1.382 grams got, you know, got distributed to the solid and to the gas. Now, we don't know anything about the solid yet, right? We just know that it's made of uranium, oxygen, and fluorine. But we do know the empirical formula for HF. Okay? And in addition to that, if you guys take a look at the problem, we know how much gas we have. How much gas do we have? Yeah, we have 0.97 grams of the gas. And so what that means is, so we know we have 0.97. So 0 0.97 grams. So what that means is we have a new starting number. We have 0.97 grams of HF. And what we can do is we can use this and do some stoichiometry to figure out how many grams of fluorine are inside of HF. Okay, so I'm going to erase this real quick just so I can um, show you guys what I mean. We're going to do stoic one more time. Just like how we went from grams of UF6 to grams of fluorine in UF6, now what we can do is we can start with 0.97 grams of HF, and then we can find how many grams of fluorine are in HF. Okay, so I know that when we practice stoichiometry, we we're using it to find how, many, how much product we can make or how, many react, how much reactant we started with. But we can actually use stoichiometry to figure out how much of something is in the compound. And so that's what we're going to be doing here. So take about a minute. I want you guys to try, using the same method that we did earlier, try to figure out how many grams of fluorine are in 0.97 grams of HF. Okay, so we have our starting number here, 0.97 grams of HF. And I want you guys to do some stoichiometry and figure out how many grams of fluorine are inside of 0.97 grams of HF. So what we're looking for right now is grams of fluorine that are inside of this. Okay, so take about a minute, try solving that out.
Alrighty guys, so if you guys are finishing it up, feel free to do so, but I just wanna go over how I set up this stoic problem. Okay, so 0.97 grams of HF is what we started with. We're trying to find the grams of fluorine inside of that. So we wanna get rid of grams of HF. So we put it on the bottom and then we use the molar mass to cancel out grams of HF. That gives us moles of HF but I don't care about HF right now. I wanna find how many grams of F there are. So if you take a look at HF, there's only one F inside of HF. So they cancel out. So I have moles of F. And after that, very simple, uh, we can just set up the molar mass for fluorine and that'll give me uh, 19 grams of fluorine. So if we punch that into our calculator, uh, we're gonna start with 0.97 divided by 20. We can skip the ones and then multiply by 19 um, so the, very close to uh, the total mass, so most of HF is going to be made of fluorine. So that's going to give us 0 0.92, and I'm going to round that up to 2 grams of F in HF. Okay, so basically what this tells us that, hey, inside of 0.97 grams of HF, there are 0.922 grams of fluorine. And we're almost done with this part now, okay? So earlier we said 1.382 grams of fluorine got distributed to the solid and to the gas. We just found out how much of the fluorine went to the gas. So how would we find out how much fluorine went to the solid? Yeah, you just need to subtract, right? Because if I started with 1.382 and then 0.922 went to HF. That means the difference is what ended up in the solid. So I just need to do a quick subtraction problem. And so from there, what we can do is 1.382 minus 0.922. That'll give us 0.46. Okay. So 0 0.46 of the fluorine ended up in the solid. Okay. And so there we go. Inside the solid, there are 0.46 grams of fluorine. I don't, I think I'm overcomplicating it. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you're like under pressure with the time. Yeah, and that's why like when I talk about the AP test, I kind of say it's unfair just because you're going to do so many problems you've never seen before. Like even if we do a bajillion practice problems, I'll never be able to show you every single problem that's that can come out on the test. And so, yeah, it's tough. You just need to kind of figure it out as you go, which is hard when there's a time limit. And Yeah. But so far, is this making sense, guys? You guys good? Okay, we're actually not done yet um, because it's not asking for grams, right? It's asking for the percentage, right? And so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna erase this up here. We just need to calculate what percentage of the fluorine, original fluorine ended up in the solid and the gas. So let's do some a uh, little bit of percentage and then we'll be done. So let's figure out the percentage that went to the solid first, okay? We said the solid ends up with 0.46 grams of fluorine. So it's going to be 0.46 grams of fluorine. We know that percentage is just what you're looking for divided by the total. The total was 1.382. So 1.382 grams of fluorine. Okay, so there you go. And then you multiply that with by 100%. And that'll tell you the percentage of fluorine that went to the solid. Okay, so take a second to solve that out. I'll also give you guys a minute to solve out what percentage went into the gas. And then after that, that's your answer for part B. And that's it.
All right, guys. So if you guys are finishing up the second uh, percentage, that's totally cool. Um, but you should have ended up with about 33.285, something close to that. Uh, about one third of the fluorine ended up in the solid. And then obviously that means that about two third, which is going to be 66.715% um, ended up in the gas. Okay, so most of the fluorine ended up in the gas, not the solid. And this is going to be your final answer for part B. Okay, 33% of the gas or the fluorine went to the solid and then 66% of that went to the gas. Okay. And that's gonna be it for part B. Any questions about that? I know that some of you guys can do the percentage calculations a little bit quicker. If you guys notice, uh, 0.46 is about half of 0.922. And so if you kind of notice that ratio, this is double that, and then that's three parts inside 100%, that gives you about two thirds and one third. But if that didn't make sense to you, just do the percentage calculations. Alrighty, let's move on to part C now. So I'm going to erase this so that we have some more room to work with. But I want you guys to take a look at part C. Okay, why did I write E here? Okay, so if we look at part C, now we're finally looking for the formula of the solid product. Okay, so we know that the solid is made out of uranium, fluorine, and oxygen, right? Now we're going to be looking at what the actual formula for the for that compound is going to be. Okay, so the way that we do that is we just need to start um, with this number that we got for the solid. Okay, we said earlier that inside of the solid we have 0.46 grams of fluorine. Okay, so I'm going to write that down. We have 0 0.46 grams of fluorine in the solid. So the solid is made out of 0.46 grams of fluorine. Okay. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare that with the mass of the actual solid. So if you guys take a look at the problem and the information that it gave you, hopefully how, uh, what is the mass of the solid product? The total mass. Exactly. 3.730 grams of the solid. So the entire mass of the solid is 3.73 grams. Okay. So let me pull up my little white screen again. So what that means is this entire solid right here has a mass of 3.73 grams. Okay. So the total thing is going to have a mass of 3.73 grams. And 0.46 of it is going to be fluorine. OK? And so what we're going to do is what we're, we're going to co be comparing uh, this mass of fluorine inside of there and the mass of the solid total in order to figure out what the formula is. Okay, so the first thing that we can do is we can just find out how much the rest of the, uh, the total mass weighs, okay? So the total solid is 3.73 grams total. And then if you subtract the fluorine from there, 0.46 grams, that's gonna give you the mass of the uranium and the oxygen in there. So take a second, just try solving that out real quick. Okay, that part should be pretty simple. Um, you're gonna have a remainder of 3.27 grams and that's going to be consistent uh, consisted of uranium, not ore, and oxygen. Okay, so the fluorine makes up 0.46. The total is 3.73, and then 3.27 is going to be made of the uranium and the oxygen. 
All right, so far so good. Okay. Did I? Oh, no, no, sorry. Okay, so now before we move on, what we have to do is now we have to consider uh, the other compounds, okay? So if you take a look back at the problem, right? If we notice our equation right here, um, the compound is made of uranium, oxygen, and fluorine. We got the fluorine good to go. The other problem is uranium and oxygen. So there's two different reactants. Okay, where does the uranium inside of the solid come from? Yeah, UF6, right? Because water obviously doesn't contain any uranium, thank God, right? And, but what about the oxygen? The oxygen comes only from the water. Now, if you take a look at the problem, does it tell you how much water we used? No, right? We don't know the mass. So it's unknown mass. We don't know how much water we used. However, we know how much uranium we used, right? Because we know how much UF6 there is. Now, earlier we said that inside of UF6, there's 1.382 grams of fluorine, right? We know that this is the only thing that uranium can come from. So if we figure out how much uranium is in here, we can figure out how much uranium is in here. Okay, so take a second. This, should, this, this shouldn't take long. Try to figure out how much uranium is inside of UF6. Okay, we know the total mass is 4.267. We know that 1.382 grams is fluorine. Spoilers. Take about 20 seconds. Try solving that out. Shouldn't be too hard. Okay, so hopefully all you did was take the difference of the two. So our total is 4.267. The fluorine inside of UF6 was 1.382. That means that inside of UF6, there's going to be 2.885 grams of uranium. And we know that none of the uranium went to the HF, right? HF only got fluorine from this compound. So that means the only mass of floor, uh, uranium left over is 2.885. So we have our mass of uranium in the solid, 2.885 grams of uranium in the solid. Okay. And again, we know that because the only uranium inside this reaction comes from UF6. Okay. Okay. So we have the uranium, we have the fluorine, you guys think you can find the oxygen? Hopefully. Yes, I hope so. Okay, so take, take about 30 seconds, try that out. It's a quick subtraction problem. We said that the solid that we don't know about yet has 0.46 grams of fluorine. It has 2.885 grams of uranium. And earlier we found that the uranium and oxygen combined are 3.27. And so if we just want to find oxygen, all you would have to do is subtract the mass of uranium from 3.27. So all we would have to do is subtract 2.885 grams of uranium, right? Because this is uranium and oxygen. So if you subtract that, 3.27 minus 2.885, you're going to get a mass of 0 0.385 grams of oxygen. Okay, so there you go. We have all the masses of everything inside of the solid. Okay, isn't chemistry fun, guys? You can find out all these different things about these compounds using numbers. Yeah, what's up, great. Oh, how do we find the mass of oxygen? Oh, are you asking how we found it? Okay.
That's none of you guys, right? Okay. So, um, so great. Um, we started, we, earlier we found we got 0.46 grams of fluorine in the solid, right? That, did that part make sense when we've got that in the last problem? Okay. We just found out that there's 2.885 grams of uranium because your, their only uranium comes from UF6. We found out earlier how much fluorine is inside of UF6. And so if we just subtract the fluorine from UF6, we get 2.885 grams of uranium. And since there's only this much uranium inside of the reaction, there has to be the same number inside of the solid. Does that make sense? And so what we did from there is all we did was subtract, right? Because earlier we said that um, the total mass of the solid is 3.73. And basically what we did was we took away the F, which is 0.46 from UF6. We subtracted this, and then we subtracted the mass of the uranium. Whatever's left over is gonna be the mass of the oxygen. That's how we got the mass of the oxygen right here, 0.385. And so if you added up uh, these three numbers right here, the uranium, the fluorine, and the oxygen, that should give you 3.73. So all we're doing is taking away what we already know to figure out the difference, which is the mass of the oxygen in there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. All right, now all we need to do is we just need to um, find out the formula. So does everyone have these masses written down somewhere? Okay, so now it's empirical formula time, okay? What we need to do is we need to use these numbers to uh, find the empirical formula. But before we can do that, we have to find the percentage of these, uh, what is it, these elements inside of the inside of the total product, the total solid. Okay, so what we can do, I'm gonna write this right here, 0 0.385 grams of oxygen, okay? What we can do is we can just uh, find the percentage of these. So fluorine, there's 0.46 grams of fluorine. So if I wanna find the percentage of fluorine inside of this solid, what I have to do is 0.46, divided by the total mass, which is 3.73, and then multiply that by 100. That's gonna give us the percentage of fluorine inside of this compound. Same thing with oxygen. We just need to do 0.385 grams of oxygen. We're gonna do 3.73, which is the total mass. Multiply that by 100. That'll give us the percentage of oxygen inside the compound. And then again, same thing with the uranium, 2.885 grams of uranium divided by the total times 100%. That'll give us the percentage of fluorine, oxygen, or uranium. So before we can find the empirical formula, we need to find out what percentage of the total mass is made up of these elements. And so that's what we're doing here. So I want you guys just to find fluorine for me. I'll give you guys the numbers for oxygen and uranium. Um, because I don't need you guys doing mass percent three times. But for the uranium, um, we should get about 77.35 gram uh, percent. And for the oxygen, you should get about 10.32 grams uh, percent. So hopefully for fluorine, you guys got uh, something like this, 12.33%. Yeah, 12.33% fluorine. So this solid right here is 12.33% fluorine, 10.32% oxygen by mass, and 77.35% uranium. And so we can do empirical formula here. We can assume a 100 gram sample. So if we have 100 grams, that means we'll have 12.33, 10.32, 77.35, and then we just need to turn this into an empirical formula. So same thing we did earlier, we'll set up the molar mass to convert all of these into moles. So take a second, find the moles of fluorine. I'll give you guys the oxygen and the uranium. And then after that, we'll finally find the empirical formula for this solid. Yeah, what's up? Oh, we're on part C right now. Yeah, 
tail end of it. Yeah. Uh, Brenda, I'm recording this, so I know you came in a little bit later. You can watch the full explanation on uh, on the video. Yeah, of course. Yes, how this question was fair. Such a fair test question to ask. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and you only have, I think, what is it? You have 105 minutes to do seven FRQs. Yeah, so you have 105 minutes in the, on the AP test to do seven FRQ questions. Two of them are about this long, and then five of them are a little bit shorter. But that's why I've been giving you guys so little time to do the test, because you don't have that much time on the AP test to do all this. At least it's more time. That's true, but if you divide it up, it's about 10 minutes. A little more than 10 minutes, but. But this one's a killer. Okay, uh, for the moles, you should have gotten 0.659 moles of fluorine. You should have gotten 0.325. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong one. You should, uh, for the oxygen, you should have gotten 0.645. Sorry, moles of oxygen. And then for the uranium, you should have gotten 0.325 moles of uranium. So there you go. Those are your moles. And now we can finally do the empirical formula. All we need to do is we just need to write the element with the mole. So 0.325, oxygen was 6 or 0.645, and then fluorine was 0.659. We have to divide by the smallest number. So we have to divide it by 0 0.325. And I'm gonna give you guys 30 seconds to find the empirical formula of this compound. And then lastly, we have the easy part where we put it all together and we write the equation. Okay, so yeah, definitely part C was the toughest part of this question right here. Yeah. No. Me. <laughs> I did. Yeah. About four minutes. Yeah. But guys, you have to understand. It's my job. I had a degree in this. Uh, if you work in like radio chemistry, probably. If you can, if you can even get your hands on uranium, that'd be pretty amazing. No, it's not plutonium. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh let's uh solve it out, guys. So the smallest number is 0.325. So if we divide uh, uranium by that, it's just one, right? So we'll have U one. Okay. For the oxygen, we have 0.645 divided by 0.325. That gives us 1.98. What number is that really close to? Two, so it'll be O2. Okay, and then for fluorine, we have 0.659 divided by 0.325. And we have 2.02, .02, which is also close to two. And so there you go. We finally have the empirical formula of your solid. So what we can do now we can erase all this ugly stuff and finally replace the solid with um, UO2F2. Okay. Congratulations, guys. That's it. And so this is actually going to be the answer for part D. All you have to do is balance it now. Okay. I'm not going to go over the balancing um, just because I think you guys uh, – can do that part on your own, but I will give you guys the coefficients. Um, I'm not going to go over the steps, but you should have a two in front of the UF6, or sorry, in front of the H2O, and then a four in front of the HF, and that's it. And that'll be your final answer, okay? With the subscripts solid, liquid, and then solid gas. There you go. That's the FRQ. That's what you guys all got, right? Yeah. Dude, congratulations, guys. I was very proud of you. Dang, we took 50 minutes to go over that problem together.
So again, I do want to remind you guys that AP Chem is no joke. Um, you guys are expected to do a minimum of four hours of studying outside of class every week. Okay, and I already know none of you guys are doing that because I was in high school too. When I went home, all I did was play Maple Story for 10 hours, sleep at two, and then go to school at six. And so I know that y'all aren't doing four plus hours. And four is a minimum that we recommend. It should be close to six to seven hours of studying outside of class time. Okay. And so, yeah, what's up, Nate? What was that? Uh, I play on Scania. Yeah, yeah, where everybody was. Uh, I play Scania. What's up? Uh, so both. If you guys remember, um, on the homework schedule, I do tell you guys, you guys need, need to do reading, right? Yeah. And so, like I said, I can't go over everything in the, like that's on the test in class, and that's why you have to do reading. I recommend taking notes while you do it. Um, and I know that you guys aren't all reading the textbook every single page because that's like 60 pages a week with notes. And then that doesn't include the time for practice problems, uh, reviewing information. Hopefully the videos I put up will be helpful, um, but you will have to go kind of outside of all the resources I provide um, in order to get all the information. And I'm always available during lunch and first and second period conference, but ultimately this is designed to be like a college class. So the onus is on you to really uh, take accountability of what we go over in this class. Okay. Yeah. So Molly. Um, so I'm going to post the answer keys to the multiple choice actually right now. So you guys can check it. If you have any questions um, or if you, if I make a mistake or anything like that, let me know. Um, and I can fix that up and go over that with you guys. But what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick four minute break. And then that way you guys can refresh your brains a little bit. After that, we'll come back and then we will um, jump into unit four. So make sure you guys have unit four up on your Chromebooks. And then I'll see you guys in about uh, three, four minutes. Yeah, that's, that's like the problem solving aspect of AP Chem. You really just need to, that's why doing all these problems help just because they kind of give you, they have similar pathways. Uh, way that they can. Honestly, a lot of AP FRQ questions, you have to be a little creative in the way that you figure this out. There's more than one way to do this. Uh, but this is just the way that I kind of designed it um, to figure it out. Oh, also, guys, I forgot to mention, I'm curving the test to the highest score. Um, so whoever got, oh, for this one. Why, you guys don't want it? I don't have to do it. I'm curving the test. So I'm going to, so you know how it was out of, what is it out of right now? 14? Um, I'm going to curve it to 10, which is the highest score, because uh, two people got 10s. And so um, I'm going to be curving it to the 10. So if you got a 10, you got 100%. And then everything, and then you guys, can, that's easy math from there. Whatever you got is your percentage. <laughs> so yeah, find out who got a 10 and then, uh, and then you guys can jump them for uh, messing up the curve. The next time you get to mess up the test so bad, you just need to get a one. Oh my God. Everybody get a one and then we all get ones on the test. Nah. Like, yeah, it's, this doesn't work, guys. These alliances never work because, yeah. But you guys won't. This is the prisoner's dilemma. You guys plan all this, and then there's that one person that realized, oh, nobody's trying. That means I can set the curve and get a high score. 
doesn't work, guys. Wait, who's the other We all need to work together. We just need to get one problem right and then get the rest wrong. Everyone, everyone work together to destroy Mr. O. I just changed it to 10. No, I'm saying like Yes, I did because I thought it was the normal one, the regular grading scale. Um, but then it was some weird one that district automatically put on it. So yeah, I did change it to the typical 90, 100. It was the one on the syllabus. I uh, It was something else before, so that's my bad. But I did change it. I mean, I'm not doing You guys are doing fine. Guys, I told you, AP Chem is not fair. Wait, this is going on video. I'm kidding. This is okay. You will. I believe in all of you, except the ones I don't. <laughs> Do you believe in me? I believe in everybody except the ones I don't. Well, then who's the ones that? Don't worry about that. <laughs> That's for me to know and for you not to be. All righty, guys. So that was about three minutes. Um, it's ten twenty-six, and I do want to get through a good chunk of unit four. Um, so let's go over this. So your homework was to memorize these two solubility rules. Okay, so earlier we talked about um, how it, when you mix two compounds together, um, you can create a, a different compound. And depending on what the formula is, some of them will be soluble, which means they dissolve in water, and some of, you, some of them won't. Okay, so we have a chart here that tells us um, how to figure that out. Okay, the only two rules that you had to memorize last time is that alkali metals, um, the ones in the first column of the periodic table, um, and compounds com com uh, containing ammonium, they will always dissolve. Okay, so it doesn't matter what they're combined with. If it contains an alkali metal or ammonium, it will dissolve in water. Okay, the other one is if it contains nitrate, NO3 minus, it will also be soluble. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go over a couple practice problems. That's how we're going to start. Okay, I want you guys to use the rules that you memorized and this chart right here. Okay, that's why I said have this up. And I want you guys to figure out if these four compounds, which ones are soluble and which ones are not soluble in water. Okay, so take about a minute and a half. You can work with your partner. You can split it up if you want. Figure out if sodium carbonate, lead sulfate, cobalt 2 hydroxide, and barium nitrate. Figure out if those guys are soluble. Okay. All right, guys, I'll give you guys maybe 45 more seconds. Alrighty guys, let's go over these. If you're finishing up, you can zone me out for like while you guys finish it up, but I wanna make sure everyone has the correct answers. Okay, so let's start with sodium carbonate. I have the rules up here just so you guys can take a look at, but obviously for the bottom ones, I won't be able to show them. Okay, for sodium carbonate, who thinks it's soluble? It dissolves in water. Who thinks it's insoluble? It does not dissolve in water. Wow, you guys are 
guys are so smart. See, this is why I've opened all of you except the ones I don't. Okay, since uh, sodium carbonate contains sodium, right? Sodium is an alkali metal in group A. Sodium carbonate is going to be soluble. Okay, now you might have looked at carbonate right here, CO3 2 minus, and said, hey, this one is insoluble, but sodium is bigger and stronger. It will always want to dissolve. So even though carbonate wants to stay with the sodium, it's like, no, I got water, I'm a kid. Okay, the next one is lead uh, sulfate. Okay, who thinks PBSO4 is soluble? Who thinks it's insoluble? Dude, you guys are so good at this. It's amazing. Okay, if you guys take a look at sulfate for the rules, sulfate is usually soluble except when it's bonded with these compounds right here and lead is one of them. So this is gonna be insoluble. So sulfate is very attractive for it. It likes to dip and leave a lot of ions, but these four are so good looking and beautiful that even sulfate does not want to leave them. It wants to stick around with them. Okay. Okay, I'm sure all of you can relate. Okay. All right, next we got cobalt two hydroxide. Who thinks this one is soluble? Who thinks it's insoluble? Dude, this is too easy. Should I just give you guys the answer for that? Yeah, so this one's insoluble. And then obviously barium nitrate is? Soluble. Yeah, soluble. Good. Okay, barium nitrate is soluble because it has nitrate, NO3 minus. That's one of the rules you need to memorize. Nitrate always likes to dip. Okay, so that's it. So the next time that we meet, we're going to be doing a lab where you guys are going to be uh, getting a couple different compounds, you're gonna be, before you mix them, you're gonna predict, hey, is this gonna be soluble or is it gonna form a precipitate? And that's basically gonna be your lab. You're gonna be predicting it, you're gonna be testing that hypothesis and then seeing if what uh, you predicted actually happened, okay? So we will have a lab the next time we see each other. Okay, so um, the, soluble, the solubility rules that we just talked about, um, it not only tells us if these individual compounds will dissolve in water or not, it also tells us when we mix two compounds together, whether it'll form, uh, it'll be completely clear still, or if it will form precipitates, these solids inside of liquids. So let's take a look at a couple of reactions. We're gonna be using the same rules that we did before, but let's take a look at this. Okay, I'll show you guys how to solve these problems. So. Uh, BACL2 and K2SO4. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out, is it going to form a precipitate? Basically, is it going to form something that's solid or insoluble? Okay, so what we're going to do first is we're going to write the reactant. So just make sure you guys are following along. I'm going to write BACL2. And this is aqueous. Everything here is going to be aqueous plus K2SO4. Okay, make sure you label them as aqueous. Okay, so in this reaction, what we're doing is we're combining or we're, we're uh, going to be putting both of these in the same container or something like that. We'll be mixing these two compounds and we're trying to figure out, hey, when that we combine them, is everything going to be soluble or is it going to be insoluble? Okay, and so this, these are what we're reacting. Now, the way that we figure out if it's going to be soluble or insoluble is we're going to be doing something called a double replacement reaction, okay? So fancy word, double replacement, okay? We're going to be doing a double replacement reaction. RxN just is shorthand for reaction. Now, in a double uh, replacement reaction, it's kind of like going on a double date, okay? So if we look at BACL2, it's barium and chlorine, right? And they're, go they're hanging out, right? They're getting to know one another. And potassium and SO4, they're hanging out. And they're getting to know one another. But halfway throughout the date, they realize, hey, like we don't like the person that we're kind of hanging out with. Um, they're not that funny. But the other person looks kind of cool. So what they do is they're going to switch the person they're getting to know. So instead of bonding to chlorine, barium is going to want to bond with sulfate. So it's going to form barium sulfate okay and we know that barium was plus two and sulfate is minus two so that works out they balance each other out and then 
chlorine and potassium are like, hey, chlorine looks kind of cute. And then potassium is pretty good looking. He looks like he's working out. So th they're going to ditch who they're with and go hang out with the other one. And they're going to form potassium chloride. Okay, and this works out because chlorine is minus one and potassium is positive one. Now, the only thing we need to do here is to balance it. Um, there's two CLs and two potassium, so we just need to put two in the front. Okay, now what we need to do is we need to figure out, hey, is barium sulfate soluble or insoluble? And is potassium chloride soluble or insoluble? So let's start with um, barium sulfate. Is barium sulfate soluble or insoluble? so good at this. Yeah, it's insoluble. Okay, they, they're gonna stick together. They're like, wow, barium and sulfate are just so good looking. I want them to meet my parents. And so even though they were aqueous, now they're gonna become a solid because they're gonna stick together. Water will not break them apart. Nothing will get in between their chemical bonds. And this is why we call dating chemistry. You have good chemistry. With each other. I don't think that's true, but I'm going to make that up. Yeah. Guys, you guys have to hear some of the jokes that I tell my wife. Yeah. She doesn't have a chemistry background. She doesn't understand them half the time. And when I explain them, she's like, dude, you're such a nerd. Okay, so yeah, my wife and I are barium sulfate because we are rock solid. We stick together. Water cannot separate us. Okay, but what about potassium chloride? Is this soluble or insoluble? Soluble. So what's going to happen is they're going to hang out a little and be like, oh, chlorine smells bad. Potassium eats too many bananas. And so they're still going to be breaking apart. So this guy is going to be aqueous because potassium chloride is soluble. Okay, so this is going to be the reaction. And so if you notice, it is going to form a precipitate. So the answer is Yes, barium sulfate is the precipitate. So, hey, 50% is pretty good, right? If you go meet someone new and then half the people in the group end up get, finding someone they like, get married, have children, grow old together, retire, and then die together. That's, a, hey, that's, a, that's good odds right there. No, no, they're, they're going to find somebody, except, except potassium, because potassium is always soluble. Nobody <laughs> wants to stick with potassium. Poor potassium. Sad. Eats too many bananas. All righty, guys. So I'll take a second to do a 4.4 uh, barium nitrate. And uh, potassium hydro, oh, there's potassium. Y'all know what's gonna happen with potassium already. So take a second, write the, write the reaction and figure out if it's gonna form a precipitate or not, okay? I'll give you guys about maybe two minutes to try that one out. You do need to write the full equation and uh, put the states of matter. So tell me if it's aqueous, solid. Those are the only two options for it right now. Yeah. We already know what's happening with potassium. Nobody wants to be with the Thank you. Ranya, too far. Oh, Edwards or Pepic? Pepic. Yes, I think he's there. Just go in and just scream Pepic. He's not in there right now. All righty, guys. If you are finishing up, uh, feel free to finish up. But for the sake of time, I'm going to start going over, okay? So we're going to write barium nitrate, so BANO32. The tall white guy, right? With the glasses. 
and uh, he's, he's losing some of his hair. <laughs> hey, I'm just going to be for real with him. Hey, he's still better looking than me, so I can't say. Oh, there he is. Hey. Oh, his room, though, is right there. Mr. Papagrano is looking for you. Yeah. <laughs> you you just got recorded to the back. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, so we're gonna do the double date now. We're gonna do the whole switcheroo, okay? So barium is gonna hang out with hydroxide, and they're gonna make barium hydroxide. Uh, what do I need to do to make sure this uh, this compound makes sense, though? Yeah, two hydroxides, right? Because barium is plus two, hydroxide is minus one. So barium and hydroxide are gonna hang out for a little bit. Are they going to want to stay together, though? No, barium hydroxide is aqueous. Ooh, they, they hung out, and they're like, oh, no. It was not meant to be. OK? And then we have uh, potassium and nitrate. They're going to make KNO3. OK? And that works out because the potassium is positive 1, nitrate is negative 1. Uh, and to balance, we do need to balance this. So we would put a two right here and the two right here, okay? Now, we already know potassium. Is potassium going to be salt or is potassium nitrate soluble or insoluble? Yeah. So here, we mix it together and you're not going to form a solid. So it's like you mix it and you won't even know anything happens. So it's no, no, no precipitate. So in this reaction, they don't form anything. Okay. Poor potassium. Nobody wants to be with potassium. So I thought you were talking about barium. That's how it's all like that. It's soluble. Barium? Yeah. No, no. Why would I want to bury him? You guys want to hear a chemistry joke? Yeah. What do you do with a dead chemist? Barium. You bury him. <laughs> all right, let's move on. <laughs> All right, guys, so uh, we just wrote uh, equ equations that look like this, right? Where we mix two ionic compounds and see if they form a solid or not, right? That's something we just did in the previous problems. Now, this is called a molecular equation, okay? A molecular equation is where we just write everything that uh, is involved in the chemical reaction, things that we mix and the things that break apart. I'll see you great, okay? But if you guys notice, in the reaction we just looked at, right? Um, so if I go up to earlier, with bari uh, which one was it? Oh, this one right here. With barium nitrate and uh, pot uh, potassium hydroxide. If you guys notice, neither of them formed the solid, right? They all stayed aqueous. They all stayed dissolved in water. Okay, so in that situation, because if we take a look at... Um, this container, right? Let's say we have a container and I put in barium nitrate. We said earlier that the water breaks apart these ionic compounds, right? Because one side is positive, one side is negative. So barium nitrate, when you put it, an aqueous solution of it in, they're not stuck together. They're kind of on their own like this. And then potassium hydroxide, same thing. It's kind of just hanging out uh, by itself. They're broken apart. Now, if they don't combine to form any solid, Basically, nothing happens, okay? Because if there is no precipitate, okay, there's basically nothing that happens. Nothing really happens. Because if they were already broken apart, right, inside the liquid, and you combine them and they stay broken apart, nothing really happened. Just like how if we went on, like, if you guys went, not we, if you guys went out on a group date, right, and you guys were all single when you guys went in, and then you guys all came out and you guys are still single. Did anything really happen? Nothing real. No, nothing happened. You guys are still single. And that's good. I always recommend stay single in high school because you guys are going to break up anyway. Anyway, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Do what you want. It's your life. But the point is, there was no chemistry, right? If you guys went in single, came out single, no chemistry. Nothing happened. Same thing here. You go in. Aqueous, you come out aqueous, nothing happens. There's no chemistry. 
And so that's the problem with just writing these, uh, these uh, molecular equations, okay? And so if we wrote it out like this, if we wrote out all the ions, it would look like this. We split up everything into the ion form. This is called a complete ionic equation. But in chemistry, we don't like wasting our time. We don't like writing down things that didn't really happen. Instead, we only care about things that do happen. And that's what we call a net ionic equation. And so let's just go through the three examples right here. A molecular equation is where you write the names of all the molecules. A complete ionic equation is you break down the molecules into the ions. And a net ionic equation is where you write only the things that actually happen, only the chemistry that happens. So if nothing happens, if they all stay aqueous, you don't have a net ionic equation. But if some a precipitate does form, the, only, the things that are involved in that precipitate formation is going to be a net ionic equation. So I know that's a little kind of long-winded, but I think doing an example will be pretty helpful, okay? So we're gonna start by writing the molecular equation, okay? This is the one that we're familiar with. Okay, so let's start with calcium chloride. I want you guys to just take about 30 seconds. I want you to write the formula for calcium chloride and sodium carbonate, okay? They're both aqueous. So I just wanna, I want you guys to just write down their formulas first. Calcium chloride, sodium carbonate. Take about, not 30 seconds, I'll give you guys 45 seconds to write that down, okay? And then after that, we'll finish writing the molecular equation. Nobody wants potassium. Hey, but who knows? Potassium might blossom one day. I always tell everybody, be nice to the people who aren't that good looking in high school. Because from my experience, the people who are like really good looking in high school and stuff, they're not that good looking later in life. But the people who aren't that good looking, they end up blossoming and they look better. And so if you're nice to the people who aren't that good looking, they'll remember you as that person who was nice to them. And when they turn good looking or pretty, that's when you can, uh, you know, give them a call and they'll have a good impression of you. Yeah. You don't have to be too nice to the people who are pretty now because that's their peak. It's all downhill from that. Anyway, I, I probably shouldn't put this in the video, <laughs> but this is Mr. O's dating advice. You should put it, in the video. it is going to be on the video so that later on in life, when you guys are like, oh, maybe I should be mean to that person because I don't find that attractive. You'll listen to this and you'll remember. Like, oh, they might peak later. I am definitely one of the people that peak later, so. All right, let's, uh, <laughs> let's write this down. So what did you guys get for the uh, chemical formula for calcium chloride? CaCl2. Yeah, CaCl2, remember? Because calcium is plus two, chlorine is minus one, you need two chlorines, good. Okay, and this is gonna be aqueous. Okay, plus sodium carbonate, what did you guys get for that? Yeah, Na2CO3. Okay, and that's also going to be aqueous. Okay, so these are our, um, our reactants. Now, before we do the products, I want to show you guys how to write the net ionic equation. Okay, for the net ionic equation, all we do is we take these compounds and we just break them up into the ions. So we're going to break CaCl2 into Ca2+, that's aqueous. We're going to break up Cl2 to 2Cl- aqueous. We're going to take Na2CO3, and then we're going to break that up into two Na pluses and a CO3 2 minus. Okay. So net ionic equation is kind of annoying to write um, just because you need to write all the ions. I'm not going to be expecting you guys to write these all out for the exam, but just know how to use them because this will be helpful for finding the uh, for the net ionic equation, which is important. Oh, sorry, this is not net, this is complete. I'm sorry, complete ionic equation. Sorry, sorry, Mr. O is getting old. Okay, and so if you guys notice, all we did was we broke down 
the ionic compounds that we start with into the ions that make them up. Because when you put them in water, they dissolve, and this is how they exist. They just kind of float around in these forms. Okay, now we can do the double date. So let's do the double date. Calcium and carbonate are going to bond, and they're going to form calcium carbonate plus sodium chloride, so NaCl, and we're going to need a balance set by putting a 2. And what we need to do now is figure out, are they going to stick together or are they going to break up? Okay, so let's start with calcium carbonate. Is calcium carbonate going to be uh, soluble or insoluble? Yeah, so this one does not dissolve in water, which means it's going to become a solid. solid. So calcium carbonate, they're going to stick through. They're going to get married and have 10 kids and buy a house and have a dog and then retire together. <laughs> okay. But what about NaCl? Is NaCl going to be soluble or insoluble? Soluble. There was no chemistry. They broke up right away. But that's okay. Because chlorine might find someone, but nobody likes sodium because it's an alkali metal. It will never stick to anybody. Okay, so if we break down NaCl, that means we're going to get two Na plus, and it's going to be aqueous, plus two Cl minus, which is also aqueous. So if you guys notice, everything that's aqueous, we just break it down into the ions that they are. If it's solid, though, it sticks together. Sodium is salty because nobody wants to be with sodium. Nobody can handle sodium. It just breaks down too easily in water. Okay. All right. And then last but not least, we're going to write the net ionic equation. For the net ionic equation, all we do is we got, we're going to write down the ions and the precipitate. So the precipitate was calcium carbonate. And so we care about calcium. So we're going to write calcium, Ca2 plus aqueous. Chlorine doesn't contribute to the precipitate. It doesn't do anything. So we don't care about chlorine. We don't care about sodium, but we do care about carbonate. So we're going to write CO3 2 minus. That's going to be aqueous. And that's going to form CaCO3 solid, which is going to be your precipitate. OK? All righty. And so that's the, going to be the differences between a molecular equation, which is kind of what we're normally used to, or we just write the full compounds, the complete ionic equation where we break everything into the ions and see what if they form a precipitate. And then the net is you just write down the ones that form the precipitate, because that's the only real chemistry going on. They're the only ones who ended up dating after the group date. Okay. All righty. So I know that was a lot of information, um, but that's going to be it for today. I have the answer key for exam number three posted on Canvas. So you guys can either relax for the rest of the class period or uh, double check your answers to the multiple choice. If you have any questions, you can let me know. Or if I messed up anywhere while grading your test, come let me know and uh, we'll figure that out. All right. But that's pretty much it for today. Good job, everybody.